Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Revealed. This week, the shop looks a little bit different than it has uh, recently. We've gotten a lot of parts out of the shop and into finish, and now we're working on wrapping up a few other small projects before we jump into our next larger project, which is another kitchen. Right next to me in our vacuum bag, we actually have a couple samples for a new job that we're working on with Hutker Architects. We're still really early on in this process and we wanted to make sure we had some samples to them so that we can make sure that the material selections are exactly what they're looking for. So I'm gonna go ahead, open up the bag and kind of show you guys what we have going on here. I got a few different samples and we're actually going to make a couple more. So let me open that up and show you. All right, so the idea here is they are going for an ash exterior with exposed plywood edges. And these are two and a quarter inch thick samples for an interior door. Standard ash veneered plywood that we cut into three pieces and layered up. So if you looked close in between the layers, you are able to see that there's a layer of veneer on each side. So two layers, this dark line here and this line here. At this point, we're not too sure if that's going to be acceptable. It's not gonna to be too noticeable, but if you do look at it, you will be able to see that layer. I made a few phone calls with our local suppliers and was able to source some of the poplar veneer core without the veneer on the face. So what that means is I basically get a stripped down version of this poplar core without any veneer on there. What that's going to allow me to do is sandwich up these pieces in the same exact way without having a veneer seam in between. And then I can go ahead and lay our own veneers. Since this project is large, we're going to sequence our veneers and probably hand stitch them anyway. So I wouldn't just be using an off the shelf plywood for this application. So I'd almost rather just have the stripped core so I am able to apply my own veneer makes life a little bit easier. It's one last step for me. I'm not too sure at this point how large these doors are going to be. We might run into some issues with trying to make something so large out of plywood. We might be better off using an MDF core, edge banding it with a plywood veneer, something we would probably make in-house. So take that same process, glue up those three sheets and just take thin rips so that we can glue them up to our doors. Again, this is just kind of future-proofing this idea so that we're not running into issues later on down the road. Another alternative that we have here is actually using a Baltic birch core. So this is often known as multi-layer plywood. It does have quite a bit more layers per piece than standard veneer core plywood. They also manufacture this with a marine grade glue. And since there's no veneer on here, we're not gonna end up with that seam in between all of our layers. This also provides us with a nice, fresh, clean substrate to apply our veneer, our ash veneer in this case, so that we do have that ash face with our exposed ply edges. So the first step in making these samples was to actually just glue all of my pieces together. Since this first one is already ash plywood, I can set that aside so I can trim it up and cut it in half and make a few samples out of this clean it up and send it up to finish. But with our Baltic birch one, we're going to want to add that ash veneer. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that real quick now, throw it back in the bag, let that glue cure for a few hours, and then go back and trim them both later. So one of the things that you're probably gonna notice here are the different colored tapes. What are they and why are we using them? So when we get our raw veneers here in our shop, we are hand stitching them. What that means is we are taking two individual flitches. So this being one piece, one flitch, and we are actually book matching it with another piece so that we can make those wider panels and end up with a really nice looking book matched veneer. And to do that, we're using this white tape. It's called a veneer tape. It is water activated. So you're using a combination of a wet rag, and that tape to apply this. It sands off pretty easily, it holds very strong, and it's made for exactly this process, hence the name veneer tape. It holds strong, it sands off very easily, and it doesn't leave a residue behind. This is exactly what this tape is designed for, hence the name veneer tape. These are extra pieces of veneer that we've had kicking around for a long time. So the blue tape was to just quickly put these pieces back together. You can start to see they're separating from being stored. 
just easier and faster in some cases to use the blue tape, especially on a piece that's just a sample where it's not as important as the finished product. We're still able to peel this tape off pretty cleanly and sand it out evenly, but it does leave a little bit more residue, so you have to sand a little bit more thoroughly. And then you might notice on this section here, we actually didn't use any white tape. This was just a random cutoff that I needed to use to balance the back of my sheet. And the seam's actually not very good either, but that's okay because I'm going to cut these pieces in half. So they really don't need to be book matched like this. This was just a piece that I had kicking around and a longer scrap that I cut in half to balance this out on the back of the substrate. So with our pieces already cut to rough size, I'm just gonna go ahead and glue them up real quick. I don't know if I already mentioned this, but um, So while we're on the topic of veneer, a couple of episodes ago, I showed you guys some veneers that we got that I wasn't quite happy with. And in a subsequent episode, I did also mention getting the new veneers in, but I haven't shown them to you yet. And since we are about to start fabrication on this project, let's open up these veneers and take a look. Beautiful. So if you guys recall, one of the issues that I had was I needed six of these sheets to be sequenced. So what that means is, so what that means is the veneers are actually cut in succession and then stitched together and each sheet is in order. And because wood is a natural product, we are going to get a slight variation in between the pieces. And these particular sheets aren't stitched in exactly the same manner each time. So we do end up with one extra flitch or one short flitch, depending on how you want to look at it, on each side, which if I was doing this by hand, we wouldn't end up that way. Fortunately, we don't need full four foot runs of this. So we are able to kind of pick and choose across those flitches where we want our pieces to land. And this will give that graining a nice balanced look once we do cut our pieces closer to size. So these are going to be for a large sliding room divider kind of barn door, um, and we're calling it the bubble screen. It ends up with a series of circles and different sizes and patterns across these three pieces. And in between them, it gets this nice, somewhat translucent blue acrylic. So to my other side, we have quite a bit of walnut plywood out and about here. We're actually taking a look at it to pick and choose the grains since a lot of this is going to be seen. What this is going to be is a master closet for our South Boston renovation. We've recently completed a vanity inside there, as well as a built-in bookcase and coffee bar, which will get installed once we install this closet, which is in a couple weeks here. As you can see, we have quite a bit of miter wrapped pieces. What that is, is we take one sheet of plywood here and we cut a return, usually only a few inches, so that that grain wraps around that mitered corner. So we have several of these on this project that we're gluing up, leaning up over here and some on the bench, and leaning up on this wall, we have some adjustable shelving areas. This is a pretty big walk-in closet, so there's gonna be a ton of cabinetry and storage space for them. So we just started fabricating this project today, so we'll be sure to keep you in the loop as this project progresses. So for now, we're gonna wrap this episode up. Please leave us some comments, let us know your questions, let your friends know about the show, and we appreciate you watching. We actually pulled James back in for the Q&A, 
You guys had a ton of questions about our cabinetry installs and what tools we're using. So keep watching and here it is. Hey guys, welcome to the Q&A portion of Revealed. In this week's episode, we covered the install van and the tools that we're using for uh, our installs. And James joined us during that episode. So we brought him into the Q&A. A lot of the questions that we got were directed towards the install side of things. So who better to help us answer them, huh? Yeah. Um, so let's just kind of dig right into it. Sure. One of the first questions that we got yeah. was, uh, I'd be interested, you, you mentioned talking about your backpack, your bag with <laughs> okay. your hand tools. Right. So what is that bag? So that is a Vito Pro Pack. Um, it's, it's a backpack. So I think, it is a backpack, I think yeah. people were under the assumption that it was like your tool pouch that you wear during the install. Nope, nope, just a backpack carries all my hand tools and, and basically like, like all the little things that I need. Drills, hand tools, right. things of that nature. So, which kind of brings us to a, a different point. We actually have a company policy against wearing pouches around finished cabinetry. Yep. Tell us a little, a little bit about that. So I do have a couple, or had a couple um, tool belts in that video uh, in the van. Those are for times when I am not working around finished cabinetry, uh, especially when we have like anything painted on site already. Those bags just become really cumbersome and it's really hard to move around cumbersome? the space. Did you say cumbersome? <laughs> Don't make wow. me sing it. <laughs> James gives um, me a hard time for saying cumbersome, so. Yeah, so we're not allowed to use any kind of pouches or tool belts near finished panels. It's just too much chance of scratching. Yeah, and we've done it. We've, we've damaged yeah. panels, we've damaged countertops, um, and it's just something we... What? Nothing. The peanut gallery over here. <laughs> what do you got? Ever since the incident. <laughs> so we, uh, we just try to avoid anything that kind of hangs around right. tools, and if we are handling finished countertops or finished panels that um, are large and kind of require a lot right. more of our body, let's say, We'll take the knives out of our pockets, the tapes off our waist, rings things, off the hands. things like that, so that we are <laughs> protecting the finishes and not not damaging right. any of those. So another question was, what? you just what? <laughs> you get so worried about these questions. I am worried about these questions. But see, now you know what it's like when yeah. I want to be fed the questions before and Doug won't tell me. Tell Doug to tell him uh, to us. Um, <laughs> So the screw locations, are you always yeah. putting a screw in the top and bottom of each corner on every cabinet? If I can, yeah. I mean, if, it, if it's available, it's generally speaking an inch or two inches off the right side and down from the top. So it's, you know, looks nice and tidy up in there. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as like, if I'm gonna screw cases to like case to case, I'll put it either behind the hinges or um, behind a shelf if possible, but generally speaking behind the hinges from case to case. But on the back wall, it's, yeah, if we can have right. the right blocking and whatnot, those are pretty uniform. Burning question. Where'd you get the jacket? That's serious. Chef Con. Why don't you give him a spin around for him? I'll, I'll give you the I'll give you the model later. Um, <laughs> anyway, the it's cold out here today. It's gonna rain. It's not that cold. It's brisk. It's brisk. Um, so kind of two parts to that mm -hmm. is one, the the blocking is nice because it allows right. us that freedom to put those screws wherever we want, right? We're not limited to where the stud locations are. We kind of covered this in the episode. Yeah. Um, but it, it's also nice because then we can put those screws uniformly, let's say two inches down, two inches over, every corner, both top, bottom, left, right. right. And then when we are, we're, we're big advocates for screwing the cases together in hidden locations so that you're not seeing them, you know, you don't have a hundred screws looking at you yep. when you open up a cabinet, yeah. so. Um, we actually got a couple questions that they want you to list off every tool that you right, have in your van. Let's do it. So how much time you guys got? <laughs> um, I'll just tell we, you what I have, kind of, if you want me to go through them. Just rough, it's right, they're all right here. You can give us a quick Real rundown, quick. but. I got a fine tool, a jigsaw, a Raz, laser, um, sander, lamello, domino, my batteries, two vacuums, a track saw, chop saw, and that's about it. Table saw. As far as tools, not a table saw, right? Um, <laughs> so the RAS, that was another one that people Sorry. were asking about. Yeah. What's it stand for? RAS is R A S. Yeah. It's not R A Z Z. Um, I have no idea. Radial something sander. Hmm. I bet My, you it says it. I way. bet you if I wasn't all the time. Rotary attached, sander. That was close. Something rather. <laughs> um, but again, what we're, we're using this for scribes. Why Pretty do you prefer that over, say, the power planer, which I prefer? I feel like I have more control 
over yeah. the rest than I do a power planer. I think a power planer is great for long, um, not wavy, More but like, like a heavier removal of stock. Right, you're taking mm -hmm. a lot off at a time, and it to basically when you're scribing that you're changing the angle to try to get more or less to take off. Um, I find that I'm, I have more fine motor control of the RAS because it's a smooth, it doesn't like chatter like a, a disc sand, or a grinder would. Mm -hmm. It's just like a nice smooth, very powerful, doesn't bog down. It's not gonna like pull you or push you. It's, you're moving in one direction and can take off very little amounts without having to like ruin panels and it cuts down. This is a big thing for me because a lot of times a power plant you end up chipping out uh, even with tape. Mm -hmm. So that cutting down is nice for me. So when you were talking about like removal of heavy, like heavy removal of stock, you're not doing that with a RAS. You're going ahead and you have table saw. Um, Track saw on a bevel. Or even the power even the planter. planter for that. Yep. And then you're going back and kind of creeping on that line. Right. Finally with the, the RAS. And you can take that down pretty good. Did you get good. the jacket the same place you got your pomade? Matt Moore wants to know. Matt Moore, look. You and me. This question's for you then. Yeah. Why is your hole saw kit so big? Dude, listen, Matt, <laughs> all right? I got a lot of hole saws, okay? Sometimes we use them. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> Old houses, big plates. I think it, it's... Just so we have them, just you know, because, right. just in case. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I did see that comment yesterday. Wow, this Doug's getting fresh when he's he not is, on camera. He's a little frisky. What do you use more <laughs> on installs, Lamello or Domino? Lamello. It's, uh, it's handier. You can do more things. It, it, yeah, just Lamello all day. I think too, part of it is because everything that needs to be dominoed is typically dominoed in the shop. Right. Things like, yeah, you're having like the cases and stuff, but when we're using dominoes for glue ups, that's right. not something you're doing in the field. Dominoes are great for alignment. They're not good for holding things together. So if I gotta like keep, like I, for instance, I just did two little boxes inside of cabinets that were uh, on top of a countertop. And I lamelloed those into the case so it basically covers up the outlet that's inside of a, a countertop cabinet and it's in there it's not going to come off i mean there's no way to get it to come off unless you ruin it basically that's going to be one of the <laughs> nicest things about having the lamello yeah. over the domino yeah. is being able to remove stuff mm -hmm. like the face frames right you know dry fitting them is great but it gets tricky for the glue up and then just having that extra yeah. pressure is it's great, and then if you do need to pop it off, right. awesome to have that you can. flexibility. Yep. Edge band finish. Edge yeah. Band so this finish. was another another question that we get here and there is because we're subbing out all of our finish. How are the finishers going about edge banding? Uh, sorry, painting and edge banding on mm -hmm. a pre-finished case. So that's actually not something that we're doing here in the shop. We just edge band the actual cabinet cases themselves how we typically would, just regular right. edge banding, whether it's with our edge bander by hand or like using contour like contour. Or, and once it gets to the finisher, they're actually masking off. So they'll go in and tape and use some paper or cardboard to mask off the inside of the cases to then spray that edge banding. Yep. Finish it so it's color matched with the doors, the surrounding cases, what yep. have you. And they'll go back and break that little edge that the paint makes too and make it nice and cl clean and seamless. Yep. So you know what the last question I have on I don't here know is because you read my list. Before. I tried to, but I couldn't see it. What happened to the van key? <laughs> Beats hell out of me, man. <laughs> I don't know. So somebody had asked about leaving <laughs> a spare key yeah. in the apocalypse box. Which, yeah. yeah, it's a great idea. But if what happens you, have, you lock the right. the van too? But we're assuming that you have the apocalypse box with you right. in in the field. Nah, that thing lives in the van, unless I need something from it. But um. Sad news is we we are short a key. Yep. And um, we can't do that. <laughs> Costa said, "Here we go." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. All yep. right. Well, mm -hmm. now hey, we know the answer. Sometimes to that one. you know. Sometimes guys leave slight with your key without telling you they're leaving. Um, drive to you know 35 minutes away their house. Uh, they happen to be steel fabricators. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> might be named Rich. <laughs> they might be named Rich, yeah, who knows? At Caustic Fabrications. <laughs> <laughs> All good, Rich, no worries. Cool. Half inch recessed backs or flush backs typically? Mm. Half inch recessed backs? The backs of our cabinets? We're going flush. So the backs yeah. of our cabinets are flush with the edges of our cases, if I'm understanding that question correctly. Um, I have done it in the past where 
we would leave like a quarter inch, say. What? Nothing. Where we would leave like a quarter inch or so uh, proud on that. I mean, we, we would do them in house, so our yeah. joinery was a little bit different. It did allow us a little bit of flexibility when, you know, needing to scribe, let's say, up against a really out of square wall or something. But the problem was when you do go to push your screws through, you're now pushing against anything, nothing, sorry, like air, right? You have a gap back there. Yeah. So you're almost pulling your case in, your Get that the flex back panel. Bow. So we would have to go back and add, you know, a um, quarter inch filler or something, or a shim if you started to scribe it. It gets a little bit too tricky and complicated that I don't think that's worth it at all. I think right. the way that we're doing it, where everything is nice and flush, we can drop a shim down through the top. We have that solid contact with the wall. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, the more that we shim it, and this is actually kind of a good point too, going back to our locations, is the more that we shim out these cabinets, the more chance that we do have that same problem to occur, right? If, if the top of our cabinet is, you know, now pushed off the wall, let's say a quarter inch, that's no different than leaving that quarter inch there. Right. Um, on the, right. on, on the, um, the actual sides of the cases. So I think oftentimes when we are adding the shims through, we're screwing right through that shim right, so, so that the move, back doesn't push in. Yep. It's um, something to take note of so it's uh, you're not pushing that case through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You got anything you want to add? You want to tell them about the Jimmy shim? You can tell them about the Jimmy <laughs> shimmy. Go ahead. Not the Jimmy shimmy, the Jimmy shim. Jimmy I, don't th shim. I don't think we can show the Jimmy shimmy here. I'm not, I can't show you the Jimmy shimmy. All right. I can tell you about the Jimmy shim. Let's hear about the Jimmy shim. So some people have problems when you get a big case and the ceiling's there and you only have like three inches to reach your hand in and put a shim out on the backside to tilt that thing out. Were you for this opportunity? Well, you were talking you about shims. You were talking you about know? shims and Timmy in the back and I was like, nobody knows about the Jimmy shim, so I'll tell them, you know? Let's hear it. So what you do is you take a shim and you screw it to the edge or the uh, uh, end of a piece of plywood. And so it basically looks like an L, right? And you take that mm -hmm. shim and you push it in to the back of the case and then flip it down. And you'll have to cut that shim depending on how much space you actually need to shim it out the top. But then it's in the same position. When you get the screw through it, you pull and you'll break the shim off. And what's left will stay. And you'll take the rest out so you don't have stuff left up there. But your case is shimmed plumb. I feel but like this is a product line that we need to come up just with saying, now. Just saying. It would be a great thing to come up with. So what happens <laughs> when you're, you're dropping your shim a little bit further down toward that thicker part, the quarter inch part, yeah. and it doesn't break so easy? How are you cutting that? If you can't reach it, well, how the are you? screw will pop out and you got a shim up there, but you're gonna have a crown, hopefully, right? Yeah. Something I mean, would you gotta get cover. creative, man. But you can't these things aren't easy. Okay, <laughs> no, that's that's good. That's important. Yeah. Do you guys cool. ever use top star screws or an adjustable screw? Um we haven't. I, I don't know anything about the top star ones. I do no. know of another brand, I forget the name of it, Space Plugs, that one. Space Plugs. Um, yep. Haven't actually used those ones, but kind of a similar mm -hmm. idea where you can adjust that screw to allow your cabinet to have a solid backing against your wall and right. not just kind of float there and flex. Yeah, never used them, but no. I'd be interested to. Not sure what this means. Do you build around the 32 millimeter system? We do, yep. So the 32 millimeter system is all of our like the shelf pin holes, the yep. hinge holes, things like that. So we are using those systems. It, it, Do you set holes for hardware in the shop? Not for hinges, because um, we use the really, one of those, the we, the I mean, we, we do, we're putting everything on in the shop. All the right. hardware gets installed here in the shop. But it doesn't come from the CNC to us like Right, that. so we'll fully assemble everything here right. in the shop. Drawer slides, drawer hardware, everything. Um, but to James's point, we aren't having our CNC guy mm -hmm. go ahead and um, cut those holes in for the locations. It's just something that in a perfect world, it would be wonderful to do that. But right. we've run into a few situations where we've had to make some decisions on the fly yeah. or um, would have ended up with having holes in the incorrect spot and causing a little bit of Having to remake sides trouble. or something yeah. like that. You know, it's, we, we fit everything here, right? So all the doors are fit here and everything. So everything's tested. And if we need to make a change, we can make a change in-house versus having to send out a whole side and lay everything out. So mm -hmm. like you say before, it's like everything we do is custom. So it's not like we have the ability to production, make everything. Every job right. we've ever done has been different from the last. So. Right. And like the locations of the drawers are always changing. Right. Um, there's no set standard. Like 
Sure, most of the time we're setting those drawer slides right on the bottom panel or on our dust bottoms. We, yeah. we put a dust bottom, basically just a horizontal divider that runs the entire span mm -hmm. of the cabinet, both front to back, side to side, so that when you are pulling things out of that drawer or opening that drawer, things don't get caught on the lip of the drawer underneath or right. the face frame, anything like that. You have um, just a nice smooth transition. It also allows you to keep stuff from dropping back there. It yeah. gives you a nice transition, not, nice transition, nice platform for the slides for the next drawer, things right. like that. We have run into times before where we try to, and this is kind of a good point here mm -hmm. as well, is when we're installing our drawers or getting our drawers sized, I, especially on shaker doors, I always try to land the top of the drawer above right. the rail and panel separation so that we'd never have a gap going in there. Nothing could ever get drop down in that little quarter right. inch space there. And it doesn't, it's not, you know, unattractive where you have to fill it, where it becomes unsightly. And sometimes I miss the mark and we don't get a drawer that's the right height. Right. So we'll have to adjust those slides by just raising them up a little bit, raising the drawer up a hair so that we can cover that gap and make sure that we don't have any kind of unsightly spots for, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like you said, things yeah. to fall in. Right. So. Invest in a line boring machine or have a CNC shop cut cabinets out? Um, if, you're, if you're having your CNC shop cut your cabinet sides anyway, just go ahead and, and stick with having them do the line bore for you. The line bore machine is an amazing tool. It's great. I do wish we had one here, but we're not seeing the need for it as often as yeah. we would. I, I guess the space is better utilized for something else. We wouldn't be using it all that often. For smaller projects, our mini press um, to bore the hinges, it also doubles as a line bore. Mm -hmm. It's small, I think it's only seven or nine um, shelf pin holes. I thought it was, yeah. Maybe 11. Something like that, Something. I think it's, it's 11. It's, it's small. Um, so not a ton of capacity there, and yes, you can start to stagger them, but I- Being I able have, to line those back up afterwards and trying to- Well, they have like a positive stop so you right. can interlock it in there, but in my experience with using a machine that's that small, you, you the more that you're, you kind of step in those, stepping those um, holes mm -hmm. down, the more that you run into uneven issues when you do go to install a shelf. Right. And we have run into that issue before and it sucks to have to remake everything like that. Yes, it does. Um, so yeah, I would say if, you, if you're going with CNC, stick with the CNC, having them cut your holes. Line bore machines can get very expensive, but they are super handy if you're building your cabinets in shop on your own, I'd definitely say invest in a line bore. All right, so with that, we're gonna wrap it up. Um, Appreciate you guys tuning in. Appreciate you joining us for these questions. And please, as always, guys, subscribe. Leave us more comments for this segment on next week's episode. And we will see you then. Thanks.